Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Peter Serto. I'm the uh, editorial manager here at IPS and the editor of our Foreign Policy in Focus pro program. Um, I'd like to begin with an apology. I am fresh off a red-eye flight from Portland, so uh, I'm going to keep my remarks short and try to conceal all the cracks in my lucidity uh, <laughs> as I go before I pass it along. But um, I did want to begin with a little bit of framing for some of the spiels to follow. Uh, and so we opened this uh, we opened this brown bag with a series of D words. I, I, I don't know if I can remember what all of those disarmament, um, demilitarization, drugs and diplomacy. Bingo. Um, thank you. Uh, and there's a, another D word that is really good at turning out to people like to events like this one, um, and that is despair. Uh, and drinks. <laughs> drinks, drinks too, drinks is just fair. Uh, both of them very good for turnout at uh, at events like this one. And you know, cycling through those really well curated quotes at the beginning, you get a sense of um, some of the challenges facing the movement for um, for all of those good D words that we mentioned. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, we have a presumptive presidential nominee who uh, has thrown every misogynistic, racist, uh, Islamophobic, xenophobic insult uh, that he can muster uh, at the electorate. And it's proven remarkably successful in doing this. So this is a very, uh, it's scary not just because of the candidate, but it's scary because of what it says about uh, the electorate and the state of the society that's going to be electing the next president. Um, he's also endorsed torture. He has endorsed uh, targeting family members of alleged terrorists um, and a number of other very bad things that you're all banning Muslims and kicking out immigrants and building a wall and, and all of these things. Uh, normally this would make for an uncomplicated assessment of the election. Um, but it's not, because on the Democratic side, we have a presumptive nominee who uh, I think, it's like gleaned from some of the guesses that were thrown out at these things, uh, has aligned herself consistently to the right, well to the right of uh, even the Democratic Party mainstream on most major foreign policy issues. And to the extent that I would say she is uh, consistently been on the hawkish side of pretty much every major foreign policy question that I can think of. Like every war that the U.S. has launched in the last couple of years, she's been supportive of. Uh, everyone that it's already been involved with, she's been supportive of escalating a role in. Uh, and a few uh, that we haven't started, she thinks we should have started. Um, so that's the race we're having. And a really, uh, on the Donald Trump side of the equation, we have we've kind of like we're we're mixing up our normal roles of respectability in politics. Uh, one of the really scary things about the Trump campaign uh, and the kind of broader political movement it represents is this: um, it's bring the people that it's bringing out of the woodwork, the openly neo-fascist uh, and uh, white supremacist organizations that are coming out, organizing in Trump rallies. You've um, radio hosts encouraging. Um, their followers to go to these Trump rallies because they're going to find people that think like they think. Uh, and these people are coming into the political mainstream. Uh, whereas on the Democratic side, you have people that have long, for a long time been associated with the more with the Republican foreign policy establishment. Uh, I'm thinking here of uh, prominent neoconservative intellectuals like uh, Max Boot at the Cam Council of Foreign Relations uh, and Robert Kagan, especially, who was a co founder of a group called the Project for a New American Century. Uh, and he's kind of an intellectual godfather of the Iraq War, which we've relitigated a little bit in the Democratic primary, but not really, not really grappled with the full extent of um, the destruction of. Um, Robert Kagan uh, is now supporting Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. Uh, he now says it has nothing to do with foreign policy. It's because Trump has said all of these rude things about um, Muslims and um, people of color and women. Uh, but last year in the Times, um, the Times ran a story about Kagan's kind of slow courtship of Hillary Clinton. Um, and he described her basically as, he said, she wouldn't describe herself this way for political reasons, but I think she's basically a neoconservative. 
which makes sense because uh, in 2012, you know, the Romney campaign sent all kinds of um, racial dog whistles, and you know, you'll remember the 47% comment uh, that uh, circulated through social media. Um, all of these things were were racialized code words going back to the Reagan administration, and you know, the, the foreign policy. The GOP foreign policy elite found nothing unacceptable about this uh, because they were on the same pages in terms of policy. So I think if we're looking at the policy prescriptions and the kind of people that this race is bringing into the limelight and where it's a very despairing thing uh, on one level, um, but on another level I'm seeing some reason for hope and that's where we're going to, uh, where I'd like to focus a little bit before I pass it along. Uh, this race is showing, we expose a lot of emperors that have no clothes in this race. Uh, and the silver lining to the Trump candidacy in particular. So the really dark part is that he's taken this kind of, um, he's taken these racist undercurrents that the Republican Party has run with for a long time in their policy agenda and turned it into just, they're, they're no longer, um, they're no longer subliminal. They're super liminal racist messages. Uh, so that's the bad thing. But uh, the kind of the more interesting thing is that these racist dog whistles were always employed in the service of a more donor-driven agenda. Um, you know that you know the kind of Atlas Shrugged meets um, Atlas Shrugged meets Bill Crystal kind of uh, policy agenda that is shown to have almost no real constituency among actual Republican voters at all. Uh, they're running with the Trump thing. They're not running with this um, tax cuts for the rich, um, wars for the rest of the world kind of policy, the way that the party has been running on for the last couple of years. Um, that's really interesting. Trump is showing that you can be successful without paying homage to uh, that agenda. Uh, and then on the Democratic side, uh, you have this extremely unlikely challenge to the Clinton establishment from the Sanders camp. Uh, and, you know, it, and at this point in the race, we're looking at it and we're already writing postmortems of it and talking about what happens next. Uh, but it's really a tremendous accomplishment that if all people in the world, like this guy could run, a, and this political coalition could run head to head in, in a two-person race with um, the face of the Democratic establishment and be a very credible challenger. Um, there's been limitations to that in the foreign policy sphere. Like, every, like people point out that Bernie Sanders has supported certain regime change policies in the past. Uh, he's been waffly on Israel-Palestine issues um, and more generally is just more interested in issues of inequality than in ending American empire or anything like that. All the same, the longer this campaign is drawn out, uh, I think he's been more and more willing to make distinctions between himself and um, Hillary Clinton and by extension the Democratic mainstream. Uh, I cannot believe he refused to speak at APAC. Uh, he refused to speak at the American-Israel Political Affairs Committee's annual meeting uh, and gave an alternative address in Utah, of all places, uh, challenging every shibboleth that Hillary Clinton was delivering before AIPAC in Washington, in which he uh, talked about the realities of Israeli occupation in the West Bank in terms of, and, and Gaza, in terms of what it means for uh, civilian casualties when they're military engagement, in terms of what it means for people's democratic and economic rights, in terms of what it means for control of water resources. Um, this is a very low bar, uh, but it, it's one that no pol American politician of his level has cleared in my lifetime. So we're at a space where, and, and you know, I don't think he's paid a price for that. Uh, he has, he's probably not going to win the nomination, but it's not going to be because of that. Uh, and so we're creating, and, and, and I want to talk about like just one more word about Donald Trump. Um, when was the last time a Republican presidential candidate said, you know, I think we're spending too much on our global empire of military bases? Uh, when was the last time you said, like, I really think we need to, we need to like, rethink our relations with uh, countries like the Saudis? Like, to be honest, it seems imbalanced. It seems, you know, he frames it in, um, he frames it in terms of dollars and cents. He terms it in, in, in nationalistic terms. Um, but things that were just not on the table before uh, are on the table now in kind of exciting ways. So I am not at all excited about the presidential candidates that we have on the table when it comes to all of these D issues that we've been talking about here. Uh, but I'm consciously optimistic that we have space to make new progress in, uh, in the war of ideas, uh, because it is all jumbled up. Uh, and that's what's really exciting about being at 
IPS at a time like this, is because I think we are really well positioned to give some of these ideas a home and a voice uh, in a political climate uh, that doesn't actually have good standard bearers for them. So that's why I'm glad that we're here. That's why I'm glad that all of you are here. Uh, and that's kind of uh, the framing that I wanted to set for this um, for this discussion. So I think first I'm going to pass it off to Miriam. We haven't totally worked out our speaking order yet. This event is actually still being organized. But uh, <laughs> thank you for listening. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Mary. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm going to talk about um, the fuel for all of our wars and our military power projection around the world. Obviously, that is our military spending um, and an economy that has become far too entangled with and dependent on that spending. I'm going to do two things, um, talk a little bit more about what um, effect the election might have on this particular issue, and then uh, talk a little bit about what we might do about it. So briefly, back to the presidential candidates, uh, uh, the, the two um, presumptive nominees of the two major parties. Um, back to Donald Trump. Uh, he is obviously on this issue, as on so many issues, um, all over the map. Uh, he is, um, I, think, I think being unpredictable is really his grand strategy, uh, to keep us off base and, and unhinged, in my case. Um, so, so on the one hand, as Peter mentioned, um, he's talking about pulling back uh, the, from the global footprint of bases around the world. By the way, I want to mention we have the world's expert on that footprint, on, on global military bases, on US military bases around the world. In the back row, David Vine, he should definitely get in, in, into this discussion. Um, it's an honor to have him. Uh, uh, so you know, pulling back on NATO, pulling back troops uh, from Asia. Uh, the Iraq war was a disaster. Uh, when it suits his fancy, he throws around the term military industrial complex. Um, and then on there's that other hand. Uh, he will bomb the shit out of ISIS, uh, possibly including nuclear weapons. Um, he'll spend whatever it takes um, to rebuild the military, to make the military great again, so no one will mess with us. Um, he, he talks about cutting military waste, um, but he also has a defense policy advisor from Blackwater, that notorious mm -hmm. Iraq private security contractor. Um, what I think is, is one thing we can definitely predict um, about a Trump administration, if that horror came to pass, which is that it would be all about enriching the private sector and military contractors would be no exception. Um, so then we go to um, the Democratic nominee. Uh, my, my take has always been that her interventionism um, was about her thinking she needed to look tougher than the boys. Um, but I wonder how many of you read the um, New York Times Magazine piece about Hillary as a hawk a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there I got kind of new insight uh, into um, how her enthusiasm for the military has very deep roots in her personal background and, and in her psyche, which is um, worrisome. Uh, she um, wanted to increase uh, the military budget in the year 2007 beyond uh, what George W. Bush wanted to um, wanted to put into the military. Uh, lately, she hasn't. She's been she's been pressed on. You know, should we increase the military budget? Should we do what should we do? And she dodges. Um, uh, she during the campaign um, has proposed that we let a bipartisan commission decide what we should spend on the military. Um, which is obviously a way to kick the can down the road, be all things to all people, avoid the issue altogether. Um, there was one little glimmer of hope that she does have the idea that there are trade-offs. There would be trade-offs to this, um, to this, you know, to military expansion and military budget expansion. Um, there, in, a, in Iowa, she was um, talking about the need for more research into Alzheimer's, and somebody said, "Well, how are you going to pay for that?" And uh, she said, well, there might be a military asset that we could trade for that. Um, there was that glimmer, um, but it is clear that all of this intervention that she wants to do um, will be costly and obviously not just in terms of money. 
Um, so obviously, if you want to cut military spending, your best candidate is Bernie Sanders. Um, he's been talking about cutting the military budget ever since he got to Congress in uh, the early 90s. Um, in 2014, he was one of um, only two Democratic senators who voted against uh, the defense bill. Um, and he cited uh, the unmet needs of our nation uh, as the reason that he wanted to, to um, uh, vote against that bill. Um, he quotes Dwight Eisenhower uh, on the military industrial complex. He, he quotes the Iron Cross speech about uh, how every dollar uh, is a theft from American children. Every dollar spent on the military is a, is a theft from American children. And um, he wants to abolish uh, nuclear weapons. However, uh, he has not, this has not been something he's been running on, really. Um, he, he doesn't really talk about these issues. Um, and so um, if, there's, if there's to be any kind of a fight over the Democratic platform, and, and um, I'd love to hear if folks, what folks think about whether that's possible or not um, and how. Um, but if there is, uh, we all need to be pushing him to really make foreign and military policy um, a priority for his or whatever he tries to do with the platform. So, um, uh, if or, or since we have um, a Trump nominee, um, it may be that that will push the Congress into the Democrats. Um, does that mean um, that therefore we will get uh, cuts in the military budget? Not necessarily. Um, the contractors, um, as we all know, have a nice political protection racket going, um, which is putting contracts uh, in every congressional district, although concentrated in the districts uh, represented by members of the key committees. Um, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, biggest military contractor in the world, um, prime contractor on um, the most expensive uh, military project ever, the F-35 fighter jet, also the most troubled program probably. Um, they proudly uh, uh, announce on their website that the F-35 is made in 45 states. And uh, that obviously does not have to do with uh, industrial manufacturing efficiency. Um, if we get a Democratic Congress, uh, we do have, I think, a shot at some sort of decent climate change uh, legislation. And both presidential candidates have talked about um, the need for uh, boosting uh, spending on infrastructure. Obviously, um, if, when Trump talks about that, he's not talking about investment in clean energy and transportation since he does not believe climate change exists. Um, I think you know, uh, a Democratic Congress could would actually probably fund uh, infrastructure and uh, and um, you know spending, particularly on uh, climate change reducing technologies. Um, these these are, by the way, um, important pieces of uh, a program to demilitarize um, the economy. Um, so cutting military spending is not enough. Um, you've got to uh, reinvest that money in the civilian side of the budget um, to create what economists call demand pull in the economy, to take up the slack in the economy that would be caused by cutting military spending, um, and to give those contractors something else to do. Um, so, so now I uh, just want to say a few words about um, uh, what we should do about this situation. Um, and I want to cite what I think has become a surprisingly strong uh, vehicle, the, the strongest one that I, that I see at the moment. And that is um, a campaign around the Congressional Progressive Caucus's people's budget. So uh, they put out a, a people's budget, a, an alternative to the president's budget and the, and the um, congressional leadership's budget. Um, they've done this for four years. But this, in, but usually what happens is, um, you know, they get some NGO folks like us to help them put together the budget, and um, then, but then um, they sort of wait till the till the budget to the president's budget is put out before um, there's ever any kind of promotion of this budget or or um, support um, for it uh, and campaigns to support it. 
Um, but this year, um, the organizing began back in the fall. And um, it's, it's a very broad coalition. I mean, the budget is, is really a great focus for coalition work. Almost any issue um, has some relationship to the budget. So on the military piece of the people's budget, um, the lead organizations have been uh, Peace Action, particularly the Massachusetts chapter, Move On, uh, U.S. Labor Against the War, uh, Progressive Democrats, um, and Win Without War. Um, and um, there's, there have been weekly calls, um, a, a letter to the editor campaign, op-eds. Um, unfortunately, um, Congress, it appears, uh, will not be able to produce a budget this year. Um, they can't agree on one. And so uh, it will not be possible, probably, to present alternatives to something that's, that's actually not, not being put out there. They're just going to go straight, jumping straight to the appropriations process. And so the strategy of the campaign has, um, has shifted. Uh, to try to get pieces of the of the people's budget um, into the individual appropriations processes um, uh, that that will unfold. But, um, they're definitely doing the appropriations process, um, as Willie Sutton said. You know, that's where the money is. That's they're definitely going to do going to do that. Um, uh, the other part of the the campaign is going to focus on um, pressing congressional candidates to support. The people's budget. Uh, so this is this is a long-term effort, and and you know so clearly it, they're going to be pressing these candidates to support it next year. Um, so there's been some dip in participation um, in this um, in this effort since it was clear that they weren't going to be able to present uh, the people's budget as a as an alternative as a as a whole. Um, but we, I feel like we have to keep this vehicle alive. Um, it is a, it's, a, it's one way to unite coalitions, and uniting coalitions is the only way we win. Um, so if anybody is interested in getting involved in this campaign, um, I can certainly connect you um, to it. So just briefly before I, I wrap up, um, just I'll, I'll run through the, the five planks of the military portion of the people's budget. Uh, the first is to end OCO, the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, that is the war budget. So the, the, Bush, the, the Bush administration um, decided to um, find, use this tool um, to uh, increase military spending um, by saying, okay, we have the base budget, um, what, which we, we spend you know, in perpetuity to protect ourselves, but then we need a separate budget to actually fund the wars that we are actually fighting. Um, so the, the people, there are all kinds of uh, games that are being played now with this OCO budget because it, it is not um, uh, subject to the budget caps that were put in place by the Budget Control Act. So um, it's, a, it, it's become a slush fund. Uh, there are all sorts of things in there that, that have no bearing on the wars that we are actually fighting. So the second plank, uh, reduce the base budget um, a little bit, uh, not nearly as much as it, it needs to um, be reduced, um, but, but some, of the, uh, the, some of the funding would be um, redirected toward non-military security priorities like the care of veterans, medical research, diplomacy, climate change, particularly greening the military. Um, third plank, um, adjust to defense downsizing and invest in non-defense manufacturing. I think I can claim credit for most of this one. Um, this is something I'm, I've been working on. Um, there are these planning grants um, that are supposed to help communities adjust to lower levels of defense spending. Um, and I've raised a little bit of money and I've got, been able to, to fund organizers in four states to work on this particular process. Uh, it has been um, hijacked by uh, interests that, um, you know, by the defense companies uh, who, who don't really want to um, help communities adjust to lower levels of defense spending. Um, and so uh, what we're doing is trying to push that in the right direction. I could talk more about it if, if anyone's interested. Uh, fourth plank, 
modernize our defense posture. Um, some good stuff in there, some stuff I'm not happy about. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, they want to reduce the role of private contractors. Uh, they also they also say absolutely no cuts to wages and benefits for the military. Uh, there there is there is waste there, particularly in in um, the salaries of the military brass and in their health their gold plated health care uh, program. It's called Tricare. There really could be significant savings there, um, but it's heavily politically protected, obviously. Last, the last plank, um, audit the Pentagon. So uh, the Pentagon is the only agency that cannot uh, pass an audit. Um, and the reason is, not only it's so big, but also it has all of these overlapping uh, uh, accounting systems. Uh, so it's very easy to hide waste among all those overlapping um, uh, uh, systems. Um, they keep play, they keep uh, setting it as a goal. We should we sh we have to get the Pentagon budget in the shape that it can be audited, and then they say, "Whoops, can't do it this year. Got to wait till next year." That kind of thing. So finally, um, you know, what does the what does the public want to do about military spending? Does it think it can be increased or decreased? Uh, and the answer there is, uh, you know, ambivalence and confusion reigns. Um, uh, one of the best polls was done recently by the University of Maryland, and it was one of the best um, because they actually tried to educate a people a little bit. Um, they talked about, uh, uh, they, gave, they gave people a nation, they, they presented uh, positions on both sides, and then they, then they asked people what they thought. And in that case, a majority said, yes, we need to cut the military budget. It's you know, not nearly as much as, as it needs to be cut. Um, but you know, to me, the lesson here is when people are educated, uh, they will, you know, they will see that that uh, cutting the military budget is an imperative. So we need to educate and we need to organize. Thanks. Next. Who's ready? I can go. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Phyllis Bennis. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm still Phyllis Bennis. Um, I wanted to talk, come at this from a slightly different place, which is that the three people running for president, four people running for president right now, the four people who are still in the race right now, this is not a two-person race. This is still a four-person race. Um, there, I'm sorry? Well, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whoever. Um, okay. There's a lot of people running for president, and all those people are running to be not only the president of the United States, but the president of a global empire. So it seems to me that it's useful to think about how we look at the candidates from the vantage point of how's the rest of the world seeing this. You know, we know that when George Bush was running for president, there was a lot of fear. When he was elected, there was a lot of outrage and a lot of fear, and a lot of countries saying things like, who's this Texas cowboy that doesn't know anything that you're electing? You know, how dare you? And people were pretty angry. The French started talking about the U.S. as a hyperpower, and there was a, you know, and all of that's shifted around 9/11. You know a lot of that history, but I think it is still important to think about this in the context of the next president is going to be the president of the empire, which explains a lot about campaigning. It explains a lot about what are the real limits on what a progressive running for Congress feels that they can say and not say, because they know they are running to be president of the empire. They're not being, they're not running to take down the empire. So it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky business. Um, so how other people see these elections, I think, becomes very important. And I think what other people see around the world is that with all the talk about different ideas, how we should be looking for alternatives to deal with ISIS, alternative approaches to the war in in Syria, what do we do about Libya? How do we handle the drone war? What's happening in Bahrain? All these things. If we just look at the region where the majority of U.S. military assets, meaning money and lives, are being spent, what we see is that what people are seeing is that the U.S. has been at war with terrorism for 15 years, and terrorism is doing just fine. That's the bottom line. So somewhere along the line, we've got to do something different. 
Now, it's true that not all the wars against terrorism have looked the same. President Obama came into office with a mandate to end what he called the dumb war, which was the Iraq war, and with a mandate to escalate the smart war, which he said was the war in Afghanistan. Now, he did both of those things. Ending the Iraq war was kind of under pressure. It was the duress caused by the refusal of the Iraqi parliament to allow immunity for US troops that he said, OK, then we're out of here. And of course, now they're back. We're back. So that's, you know, there was a moment of ending that war, but now the war continues with US, direct US participation, direct troops on the ground, lots of boots on the ground, lots of sneakers on the ground from CIA and special forces, and God knows what else is there. But what we know is that there's 5,000 sets of boots on the ground. There's at least 300 in Syria, and there's probably a lot more than that. So what does all this say about what the options are? Well, there's a lot of options that are not being tried for how to deal with ISIS and how to deal with the war in Syria. And those two things are integrally related. Now, some of that means that what we hear from people in, in the White House, people in Congress, people in the Pentagon, what we hear from President Obama most frequently, which I always, you know, I, I want to cheer when he says it, there is no military solution. Yay! He's absolutely right. So then you want to say, but then why is it that everything you're doing is military? And everything you're sort of talking about on the side is like, well, yeah, we should also do this other stuff. The problem isn't that they're not doing sufficient amounts of the other stuff. The problem is when you go to war, the other stuff becomes impossible. So what is the other stuff? Well, there's diplomacy. There's economic pressure. There's all kinds of humanitarian assistance that we are not doing. You know, the US is 5% of the population of the world. And we have 28% of the wealth of the world in this country, controlled by people in this country. It seems to me that we should start by saying we are taking on the obligation of at least 28% of what the world needs to take care of refugees, <laughs> to provide health care to the people who have been displaced to all those things. Instead, what we see is that all the money, all the high-level attention, all the energy, all the smart thinking as it goes, it's not very smart, but they like to think it is, all of that goes to the war side. And then somebody says, oh yeah, and we should be doing this other stuff too, because you know you, you sort of need that stuff. Well, you don't just need that stuff on the side. You need that stuff instead of the wars. So what do you do? You know, in, in the book that I did, on understanding ISIS and the new global war on terror, I talk about what would an alternative policy look like. It starts with, number one, what does every medical student learn on her first day at medical school? The Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm, period, full stop. Whatever else you do to the patient, don't make her worse. Whatever else you do when you're trying to stop the killing in a war, stop killing people. Stop killing people, first of all, so that means you say you don't have boots on the ground, get them out. You say that you don't have ground troops, pull them out. You say you don't want people dying in this war, stop killing them. That means stop dropping bombs. It means stop sending drones. That's all just number one. You know, it's not rocket science. Rocket science, I guess, is complicated. I don't know. It's This isn't. I mean, I don't understand rocket science, but I don't understand biology either, so, you know. But, I think the problem that we face is that the, the range of debate in this election is way too narrow. You know, we hear explicit militarized solutions from Hillary Clinton. I've got to give her credit. She's the most clear on what her foreign policy is. And there is absolutely no reason in the world not to believe her. When she says, I would escalate in, in uh, Libya, when she says, I would create a new so-called no-fly zone in Syria, when she says, we need more troops to be engaged, maybe not all US troops right away, but other troops, and then maybe US troops, when we need regime change in Syria and to go after ISIS. I think she believes all that, and I think she would do it. When we hear from Bernie Sanders, we hear some good stuff about, we don't want regime change. OK, that's all good. But then he says that his strategy for, uh, and he says one very good thing, which is we don't need a no-fly zone in Syria. That's very important because it's no-fly zones that quickly become major military campaigns for regime change. Let's be clear about that. But he says, not only do we not need a no-fly zone in Syria, but we also don't need to be going to war 
against Assad. We should go to war against ISIS. But then he adds, and then we can go to war against Assad. So really where he disagrees with Hillary is on the sequence, not on the substance. So that's a real problem. Now, Donald Trump says, well, I, you remember that, you know, whoever won the prize, who had that amazing statement where he said, you know, a great superpower knows that it should operate on the basis of diplomacy and, and restraint and not military force. Well, that sounds great, but really, does anybody in this room want to trust that that's what he would actually do when, when faced with an escalation in Syria, a new war breaking out in Western Sahara? There's a number of things, all of which I think he would respond to militarily. Now, would he respond with drones or with airstrikes? I don't know. I'm sure he doesn't know either. But his range of options would be ground troops or not. Support other people's ground troops, change the color of the corpses or not. Airstrikes or drones, you, you make the choice. You know, those are the range of options he's looking at. Diplomacy, probably not exactly high on his agenda. Now, we have seen huge victories in the recent period of diplomacy over war. And I do give the Obama administration credit, Ben Rhodes aside, uh, for a really uh, powerful work with diplomacy on Cuba, somewhat on climate, not great, but a little bit on climate, and on Iran, perhaps the most difficult of these challenges. That was hugely important. Now, among the candidates, Bernie Sanders says he would uh, you know, he would support the Iran deal. He doesn't say much about it. I'm not sure he knows enough about it to have a, a more nuanced assessment of it. Hillary Clinton was no fan of it. She was against it. And she basically says, I don't like it, and I don't know that I'm going to be bound by it. She's a little ambiguous. Bernie Sanders is a, uh, a, an agreement that takes war off the agenda that he doesn't, you know, that he would like. So I think we have a serious problem in what it means to say we have to go back to the question of how do we get to diplomacy over war. What we're seeing in some ways, we had, you know, the Secretary of State is supposed to be the top diplomat, and yet she's the one supporting military solutions instead of diplomatic solutions. This is a serious problem. What we don't have as a problem, I mean, when we see what's happening with elections in other places around the world, you all saw what happened in London just last week, where you had an extraordinary effort of the right wing using, dare I say, Trump-esque uh, policies of Islamophobia, anti-immigrant hysteria, racism, to oppose the first Muslim mayor of London, of the great city of London. Well, guess who just took the oath of office uh, of the great city of London, Mayor Khan? I mean, this is, this is huge. This is an enormous victory. He's not all things to all people. There's a lot of problems in his politics, but it doesn't matter on one level. He won this enormous campaign uh, against racism, against Islamophobia, against all these things. That was huge. You know, we're seeing this in, in other places as well. I'm, I'm going to be in London next week. I'm hoping to see my old friend Jeremy Corbyn, who's an old friend of mine, not because I know members of parliament, but because he's been an activist in the Palestinian rights movement and the British peace movement for longer than I've been alive, I think. Well, actually not. He's not that much older than me. But <laughs> I like to think of it. But, you know, it, it, here he is, the leader of the Labour Party. Now, is he making compromises? Of course he is. Is he going to be everything everybody wants him to be? Of course not. But what does that say about the willingness of people to fight for principles in their political, in their political life, in their political parties, in their political world? This is an extraordinary thing that I think we need to learn from. So the question of how other people are looking at our elections and they're saying, what the are you people doing? And we can look around and say, actually, you know, you guys are doing this way better than we are. Our so-called great democracy ain't doing so great. So we have a lot to learn from some of the others. I do think, and I just want to say two other things. Um, well, I, I want to just say one thing about the OCO, the, the um, Overseas Contingency Operations. This is one of the great uh, acronyms of all time because it, re it was supposed to replace the real great acronym of all time, the GWAT. The GWAT is one of those words that sounds like what it is. It sounds evil. The global war on terror. This was the Obama term, right? And you all remember, the first day in office, Obama sent out a memo. This guy's big on memos. He sent out a memo to the White House staff, to the State Department, to the Pentagon, saying, we would prefer 
He doesn't give orders. We would prefer that you not use the term Gwat. We don't want to call this a global war on terror. We want to call this overseas contingency operations. And it's like, it, could there be a more Orwellian term? You know, an overseas contingency operation is a, a tsunami in Japan where you send ships to help rescue people that have been washed out to sea. That's an overseas contingency operation. These are wars. Call them what they are. Call them wars. And luckily, most people around the world, and even in this country, are still calling it the global war on terror, because that's what it is. But I think that what we're seeing is an enormous shift in the discourse in this country on so many of these issues. We talk about it all the time on Israel-Palestine. It's no longer political suicide to criticize Israel in Washington. And it's soon going to be political suicide not to. That's what we're moving towards. But we don't yet see a shift in the policy. The same is true for the wars. We, we know that it's not just not political suicide anymore, but that it's becoming more and more of a necessity, particularly if you're talking to young people, and particularly if you're talking to young people of color, to recognize that these wars are one, failing to do the job of bringing stability and democracy to the Middle East. All they're bringing is death and destruction. Two, they're not making us any safer, because when you go after organizations, horrible organizations like, like ISIS militarily, what happens is they stop trying to control territory, and they go back to old-fashioned terrorism in places like Paris or, or Brussels. So, you know, we're paying a huge price here, although the people in those regions are paying a much higher price. So the goal of our discourse shift is to go to the next level. It's one thing to change the discourse. It's really, really hard. But compared to that, changing the policy is going to make changing the discourse look like a cakewalk. That's where we are now. We've got to move to that next position where it becomes a political liability to say, I will put more money into the war budget to say, I'm going to put $3 trillion into rebuilding our nuclear weapons. The only reason that that's not creating an enormous level of outrage is that not very many people have heard about it yet. This is not what Donald Trump is threatening. This is what President Obama is doing, right? So we have these huge challenges ahead. And when we look at how to assess this, and this is the last thing I want to say, it comes back to what both Miriam and Peter started to talk about, which is the question of movements. Whatever we think about these candidates, and there's good things about a couple of them and terrible things about all of them, in my view, in my personal view, I think that what's more important than those individual candidates is the movements that they inspire. So the question is, what happens when you have a candidate that inspires and legitimizes a movement that is a neo-fascist movement based on racism, Islamophobia, misogyny, homophobia, all these, all these horrifying things, and says, this is what America is. This is why we have to take America back. You are the real America. You white, straight men. You know, this is what we are dealing with. On the other hand, whatever we think about a, a, a candidate, a candidate whose base is young people, increasingly young people of color, but particularly young people who are saying the system is broken. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? And don't we all have some obligations as activists, as public intellectuals, as activist scholars, as whatever we are, to help that cohort of young, inspired people build a movement that will outlast anybody's candidacy and anybody's presidency? And in fact, when we have a movement supporting even a failed or failing candidate, a candidate who is terrible in all sorts of ways, but a movement that is made up and at its core is organizations of people of color, we have an obligation there too to work with those organizations. Despite disagreeing on their candidate, we still have a moment when there's an, a level of engagement that we don't have in this country all the time. And that's what I think is the most important thing about this moment, is how do we build movements that will outlast all the candidates and outlast most of us? Thank you.
Okay, I guess you wanted to end on an optimistic note, so I want to talk about the drug war. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, actually, I've been working at IPS uh, since, off and on since 1989. My first stint was from 89 to 95, working with Carl Perovitz on a book on the uh, World War II and the dropping of the atom bomb. And then from 1998 until now in drug policy. Um, and I have, you know, the only thing, as an historian, the only thing I can assure you that's inevitable is change itself. And sometimes it's even for the better. So, the drug policy. Um, I've been working on this issue since, for the past 18 years. And I have seen more positive change in the past three or four years than the previous 15 years combined. Uh, it is snowballing. This is, um, the momentum is really, it's hard to keep up with all the developments. But I want to talk about why it is that this policy has been locked in place for so many decades, so many generations. It's been impossible to get rid of. The people are far ahead of the politicians, and the politicians are always the last ones to move on this issue. And we're still having a hard time at the federal level. But the state level and local levels, things are, are moving uh, in, in fairly positive directions for, for, for a change. Um, one of the reasons we've, we've been stuck in this quagmire is the demographics itself. That uh, the baby boom and the silent generations uh, kind of dominated American politics for so long, and their issues uh, that resonated with that generation tended to dominate American politics. Uh, so that, um, you can trace a lot of this back to the Vietnam War. And where one stood on the Vietnam War back in the 60s was often a determinator of where one stood on other social issues, the divisive social issues of the day, whether it was racial integration, sexual liberation, rock and roll, drugs, all these other things. These are a, a, a bouquet, a basket of, of classical wedge issues that have been very effective in U.S. politics for about four decades. And in many ways, Obama is our first post-culture war president simply because he was too young to have taken sides during the Vietnam War. But if you go back even to the 2004 campaign, uh, it was uh, third rail issues that really uh, got destroyed John Kerry's campaign. Uh, people know what third rail refers to? It's a DC term, right? Comes from the subway system, two rails carry the train, third one's high voltage, if you touch it, you're dead. You know, but these days if you take metro, any rail can kill you. But, but, <laughs> but classically, those issues would be things that politicians wanted to avoid, whether it's looking soft on drugs, soft on crime, soft on terror, uh, gun control, raising taxes, Obamacare, these are all third rail issues, Israel. right? And because of the aging demographics, and, and looking around the gray hairs in this room, I'm going to be very careful how I say this, uh, the boomer generation uh, and, and silent generations are aging out, um, receding, shall we say, into the rearview mirror of American politics. And with it, a lot go those kinds of wedge issues. So that if you're under 40 or 50, uh, those kinds of wedge issues that the uh, Republicans have traditionally tried to play off, uh, American politics don't resonate anymore. Um, John Kerry lost in 2004 two, two, two big issues. One was his stance on war, not the Iraq war, which he's supposed to, his alleged stance during the Vietnam War. He was swift voted right, for, for an ancient war. And then the other issue that really got him was uh, gay marriage, that Karl Rove uh, exploited that opportunity to put anti-gay marriage ballot initiatives on 11 state ballots, including swing states like Ohio, which really drove the turnout. Uh, and, uh, and yet, it, just to think that, that it, it, since 2004, gay marriage was a, was a divisive issue. And today, it could not be more mundane. No one cares about this issue, uh, outside of a few politicians that are, that are painting themselves in a demographic corner. Uh, but it's those, those uh, wedge issues that are no longer uh, functioning. Um, and one of the reasons it, it, those wedge issues have been so effective is that, with the, regard to drugs, the solutions are very often counterintuitive. That is to say, if drugs are bad, why not have a war on them? Right? Um, you don't want to look soft on drugs. But it, it, there are different kinds of problems in this world. And, and some of the toughest ones are the ones that have counterintuitive solutions. And what I mean by that is that the obvious knee-jerk solution is usually the wrong one. Um, Donald Trump is a great you know, example of, of intuitive gut thinking. Um, and this is my, my calling card on the Hill, right? This is a, a prop I use to, to speak with, and it's the Chinese finger cuffs, or Mexican finger traps, right? And it's a good illustration of counterintuitive solutions, that the knee-jerk solutions uh, to get out of this is you pull. But the, like prohibition itself, the harder you pull, the stucker you get, right? It's counterintuitive to think that you might need to relax and even push in a little bit, and that's how you extricate yourself uh, from these problems. Uh, the other, some of the other factors that are driving, drove us to this tipping point um, are things like budget. Um, in my lifetime, and I was born in the last six days of the baby boom, in my lifetime we have spent more than one trillion dollars in, in current dollars, probably about a trillion and a half by this point, in the war on drugs. And the drugs are winning. 
It's a lot of money. Uh, the other thing that's driving it is incarceration, incre incredibly racist law enforcement patterns, right? We have the largest prison population on the planet, 5% of the po world's population, about 25% of the world's prisoners. We incarcerate more people than any other planet on Earth, any other country on Earth, uh, and that has largely been driven by the war on drugs. And at every juncture of the criminal justice system, uh, whether you're talking about uh, which communities get policed, who gets arrested, who gets chosen for prosecution, who gets convicted, and who has to serve time, it's overwhelmingly poor people and people of color that are bearing the cost of that. Uh, some of the other factors are um, uh, the, simply the death toll. Uh, in Mexico alone, uh, since President Calderon began his, uh, the, the previous president began the war on drugs in Mexico, uh, the current phase, uh, was in 2006, and since then, more than 100,000 people, possibly 150,000 people, have died. Um, not all of them are strictly attributable to drugs, but but it's still a staggering death toll. And at the end of all this, uh, no one believes that drugs are going to stop flowing from Mexico to the United States. It's it's always been a transit zone, will continue to be a transit zone. And so, for what purpose have we squandered 150,000 lives? Um, what what end does that serve? Uh, in places like Colombia, we've been waging Plan Colombia now uh, for 15 some years, and if you look at the latest COCA statistics, which the, the U.S. State Department released in, in March, um, we're about the same level as we were in 2001 when this whole mess began. So the more we've been spraying uh, and trying to defoliate our way out of this problem, uh, farmers have been replanting, and, and now it's, it's back to, to uh, these staggering high levels. Um, because it never dealt with any of the preconditions of why people were doing this to begin with. It had everything to do with poverty, despair, alienation, not, not narco-terrorism. These aren't evildoers. These are family farmers, right? And we don't give them alternatives, and we just do the, the big stick and then eradicate and eradicate and eradicate. Um, and uh, the farmers themselves, of course, are doing what's in their self-interest. It's, 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 it's simple economic sense for them. This is the only way they can make money in these, in these regions where there's no infrastructure, no roads, no access to markets. Um, and as we eradicate, we destroy their food security. What is the one crop they know how to grow for which there are ready and willing buyers that it's easy to transport, doesn't require a lot of infrastructure, the illicit crops? So it's guaranteed they're going to continue to replant if you only do this. Right? That's what we've been doing. Um, another uh, factor forcing this change uh, is what they call the euphemism is the changing face of the opioid epi uh, epidemic in the United States. That is to say white folks, middle class white kids and, and, and adults. Uh, are uh, become hooked on opioids um, and are switching to heroin because the DEA and their infinite wisdom decided to clamp down on the pills without having a good plan B in mind. So that, of course, drove people to the illicit market, uh, where heroin is far cheaper than prescription opiates on the black market, um, and you don't need a prescription to buy it. And so, of course, we have all these people now shifting over to heroin. This was entirely predictable. Um, and another uh, factor is that we've been waging a war uh, against an enemy who's quite literally incapable of surrendering. Right? As a former military historian, I'll tell you, wars are about ex using brute force uh, or coercion to extract a, an organized capitulation, a coherent surrender from a rational state actor. Right? We've been waging war against an enemy, uh, against plants, basically. Um, plants don't you know, worry about the latest threat coming from the U.S. Congress. What's the chances they're going to get hit by a spray plane? Uh, will they fetch a better price at the market six months from now? Should they stay dormant? No, plants are not rational actors. They obey the laws of nature and the laws of the market. And unfortunately, we have a system called prohibition that creates enormous wealth where there should be very, very little. All right? And so that's what makes these plants so valuable. And the more we escalate the war on drugs, the higher the risk to the drug traffickers and to the growers and to the people involved in this economy, the higher the risk premium they can charge the next person down that economic change chain. That's why this, the commodity prices of drugs snowball as they reach the final destination uh, in the markets. And our politicians think, oh, knee-jerk solution, we need to get tougher. And so the longer the potential prison sentence a smuggler may have to serve, the higher the likelihood they're going to get caught, uh, the higher the risk premium we're building into this product. So when we talk about the war on marijuana, on cocaine, on heroin, these are minimally processed agricultural commodities. There is nothing exotic about these plants. They grow in many different climates and soils. They should be worth pennies per dose. And yet we have done what the alchemists of the Middle Ages have failed to do uh, for centuries. Right? We have actually found a formula to turn weeds into gold, basically. Uh, and that's why it's not working. Right? We keep building more profit into the system. Uh, but the, there is uh, a lot of, of hope on the horizon. Uh, I just got back from a, a, a week-long meeting in New York last month um, called the UNGAS. People have heard this term? Have anyone? 
United Nations General Assembly Special Session on Drugs. So uh, this is the last one they held was 1998. And so the UN finally got around to reevaluating the drug war. Um, and we're basically moving into two different worlds now. Uh, we have the Western Hemisphere, Western Europe, and a few other countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, parts of Africa, are moving towards reform, harm reduction, overdose prevention. They're moving away from the incarceration model. And then we have the other side of the world, uh, led by Russia especially, but also China, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, um, that uh, Vietnam, they who think that the, the way to deal with this is to execute more people, to get tougher, to have more prisons. Um, and so, unfortunately, the, the uh, international drug treaties are, have outlived their, their, their usefulness. And that global consensus, which they've always used to, to say the drug war, this consensus behind this, has been revealed to have been what it always was, a, a coerced consensus. And that consensus is shattering now. It is being held together by, by sticky tape. Um, in the cheap time, you get the dollar store that kind of dissolves after a year or two, uh, which is good because the next time the UN will re revisit this issue is 19, uh, 2019, so three years from now. By then, I think this, the, the terms will be much more stark, much more clear. We'll have more and more states legalizing cannabis, which really binds the hands of our State Department. We can no longer play the global cop, lecture other countries on how they have to toe the line. Uh, and that, in turn, along with social movements in other countries, is opening up a tremendous amount of political space, particularly in Latin America, who are no longer under the U.S. thumb in terms of, of, of drug diplomacy now. And they're able to say, look, you people are turning your backs on the drug war. We're also going to speak our mind now. And so we have country after country. Uruguay uh, became the first nation um, to implement legalization of cannabis uh, nationwide. Um, we also have uh, four states in the United States, plus the District of Columbia, that have legalized cannabis for, for adult use. Uh, and on the ballot, this November will be many more states, including California, uh, Nevada, Massachusetts, uh, a lot of other states as well. So um, the writing is on the wall in, in terms of the politics of this. And that's why you're seeing politicians finally starting to change their rhetoric on this issue. Uh, so I'll end on that note, I guess, for, for mm -hmm. once. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have about 50 minutes left in our scheduled time uh, to take your questions and comments. And uh, I would encourage anyone who wishes to to not feel shy about shuffling up to refill your wine while we do that. So tell better jokes that way. Yeah. Um, Jill Stein's photo was shown as an answer to the quiz, but she was not in the discourse that followed. And I think you did a great job. Uh, just to reflect on Phyllis's point regarding building a movement, I think Dr. Jill Stein's candidate says she's likely to be the Green Party uh, candidate for president. She's not going to be elected. Okay, that's probably not going to happen. So she won't be the president of Ben Park. But uh, this is an unprecedented, I think, opportunity to really build a, you know, a force that has a program of the Green New Deal that actually addresses exactly what people were saying, goes further than Bernie on this, uh, and uh, addresses militarism. Uh, she supports BDS, by the way, and she was interviewed. She equivocated four years ago. This time she does, so that could be ejected. In the, and here's a chance that probably, according to polls, probably uh, maybe 25 percent of Bernie supporters say they won't vote for Hillary. Now, having said all of that, I don't want Trump elected. So it's a question of strategy, voting strategically. You know, in states where you won't elect Trump by voting for Jill Stein. So I made a little plug on that. Now, one other quick point, and that is the role of the Pentagon in climate change. Uh, it's often said that the real problem with the Pentagon is had such a huge uh, global warming emissions. Uh, in a wonderful book, Naomi Klein even cites that. The fact is, it's less than 1% of global emissions. I think it misses the point about the role of the Pentagon. It's an instrument of imperial power, of the military, industrial, fossil fuel, nuclear, state terror, and surveillance complex. That's what the Pentagon is serving. And so that's it's the foreign policy that I think needs to be addressed on that. So this is a 
I'd like you to perhaps uh, talk about that. So it, it, finally, it's the this these endless wars are making it virtually impossible to curb carbon emissions in time to avoid climate catastrophe. That's why that Nick is so a uh, huge obstacle that we need to confront in terms of climate change, not the direct emissions of the Pentagon. Well, can I just say one thing about that? I, I don't think anybody believes that the only problem with the Pentagon is its emissions. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that's, yeah. So yeah, it's all those things. It, it's there to do evil in the world in a whole host of ways. Uh, and their job, very clearly, is the job of any military is to kill people and break things. You know, most militaries are accountable to some political operation uh, most of the time, and that political operation decides what people they should kill and what things they should break. But the the role of the military is all bad. So there's there's really nothing good about it. The notion of well, what about when they you know rescue people in boats that are swamped in the in the tsunami? That's a good thing, but the point is you don't need a militarized Navy to do that. You need boats. You know, the Coast Guard could do that probably a lot better than the Navy. So, I love your connecting, uh, you know, military power and, and climate change. Um, I'll just make a little plug for a report I'm working on now that I'll be releasing in, in September. I work on budgets, and so um, I do a comparison of what we spend on military security as opposed to climate security. Uh, so um, the military itself says that climate change unchecked is going to create uh, security problems that no military on earth is going to be able to solve. Um, what they don't say is, therefore, we should look at the overall spending on security and shift resources from this military force that's going to be useless to uh, actually try to prevent this threat from emerging. Um, and so that's going to be the point of, this has been the point of this work and it's going to continue to be this work. And I'm looking forward to presenting that paper at the International Peace Bureau's conference in Berlin in September. It's also important to look at counterweights though. And I think the Pentagon in some ways can be a counterweight on some of these issues that we're talking about. Uh, so in terms of the war on drugs, the Pentagon has been the one place that's actually been critical historically of the war on drugs and, and its involvement. This goes all the way back to Caspar Weinberger uh, when Reagan tried to bring the, the Pentagon into the, the drug fight. He fought passionately, he was Secretary of Defense, Republican Secretary of Defense, fought passionately against it. Donald Rumsfeld, and here's a first, I'll say something nice about Donald Rumsfeld. Um, to his credit, he has always been against the drug war. I, I suspect he's had some addiction in his family, but he gets it. He says, look, the war, is, you know, this war, if you're going to win it, it's going to be won by our families, our schools, our, our counselors, our churches, not by the military. They know that there is no enemy that can surrender. There's no coherent capitulation that's going to happen from all these individual actors. And the, the side effects of these wars um, often causes you to lose hearts and minds of people, uh, which then deals with problems in terms of counterinsurgencies and, and other, you know, creating uh, anti-state uh, sentiment. And so it's really not a good idea. And, that sense. And so that's where I get some allies is from the Pentagon. Um, you wouldn't think that. It's not because they're counterculture, it's because they realize it's a stupid war. Here and then here. If you can see people that I can't see now, so please uh, you can see them. Uh, I wondered about Donald Trump's statement that NATO being obsolete. How important you thought that was, and what we can do to build on that. Well, I can jump in first on that right. one. I, um, I think that it was in the context of his attack on U.S. allies that they don't pay their they don't pay their way, and I think it's in that context that he's saying, you know, things that are called NATO deployments are really U.S. deployments, and the others are just there for political cover, which is largely true. Um, you know, this has been true in the coalition, so-called in, uh, in in Iraq, in Afghanistan, what we used to call here at IPS the coalition of the coerced, uh, which included NATO countries, some others who the U.S. pressured to join them into, you know, to press them into joining the, the coalition, but they, they were not a, a player in any strategic sense. So I think that's what he had in mind. Now that, having said that, doesn't have anything to do with your, the second part of your question, which is the key thing. 
how do we make that point? And I think it's it's partly about what Miriam was saying about education. When people are educated about stuff, have access to information, they see things differently. So one of the things that we could be reminding people about is that NATO was a product deliberately of the Cold War. It was designed to stop the Soviet Union. Well, hello, 1990, 91, the Soviet Union collapsed. Now we can argue about how and why and whatever, but I don't think there's any argument that it no longer exists. The Warsaw Pact isn't there anymore. So the question of what NATO is there for, we saw this in 1995 at the 50 year anniversary of NATO, when they suddenly started, a bunch of sort of NATO affiliated intellectuals decided to use the, the growing wars in, in Bosnia and the Kosovo war in particular as an excuse for what would give NATO a new raison d'etre. Now, the idea that you could take a military uh, institution that had a very specific, very precise uh, identity, it was designed to do one thing, to challenge the Soviet Union and Soviet-backed countries. When that was no longer an issue, it could just dissolve, it could just disappear, and the world would be much better for it. But that was not an option, so instead they created these whole new you know, that it's now designed to do a bunch of other things that were never involved in, in, the, in the creation of NATO. So I think it's all about education. So that means all the usual stuff about writing letters to the editor, about uh, protests outside, things that Code Pink does so brilliantly, uh, whether it's, it's writing op-eds, whether it's, you know, going to do speaking events at, at organizations that might not be thinking about things like NATO. What does that really have to do with us? Well, it has to do with things like what are we spending on keeping NATO as a coherent uh, military institution that is not making anybody safer and what we could do with that money to do things that would make us and people around the world a lot safer? I haven't figured out um, how to support things that says that I actually agree with without supporting Trump. I would love to hear about how to do that, because uh, it makes me crazy. Uh, the other thing I'll just, <laughs> uh, I'll just mention, I am old enough to remember, you know, after the Cold War ended, um, uh, there was a big conference paid for by the military contractors. It was all about NATO enlargement. You know, so this is this was going to be the you know they were having trouble. My God, the Cold War is ending. What's going to the military budget is coming down? What are we going to do? Ah, NATO enlargement. That's our solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I well, what you're saying about NATO, take the example of the World Bank. Once you have a big bureaucracy, unless you can give step by step a way to apply uh, proponents, and, and I want to sound wonky, but when you look at the difference between um, Bernie's campaign and Hillary's campaign, he came out with ideals and goals. She her argument was, it's too impractical. You don't have a way to get there. So I think, um, for example, disarmament. How are you going to get to the plowshares? I think, given that there are 40 states or whatever with military bases, I think someone has to go into the weeds and show how, what are you going to do in this base? How are you going to change that? You have to get into the details because it's uh, the movements can handle the broad goals, but when you want to make changes, you have to show the people who are stakeholders in it, you know, some alternatives. Just look at what the coal miners are doing against their own interests, maybe in Kentucky. Uh, they will fight to keep the coal there because no one has shown them what else they can do. So I don't know if that's a, a IPS kind of task, but right. someone has to go into the deep, he has to get the Hillary-like wonkiness, uh, just in my view. I mean, if you look at what her platform, what her goal for, it was in the Washington Post yesterday, all she wants to do is add more bureaucrats, more regulations. If everybody knew what her real plan was, they'd throw their hands up and <laughs> So there is actually a good process in place 
um, to repurpose military bases. Uh, it, it's very orderly and it involves uh, a broad base set of stakeholders involved in, you know, making decisions about, you know, what do we want to do with this base? Um, the problem is, of course, that uh, we haven't had a base closure process uh, since 2005. The military is crying out for, it says it has 25 percent excess, excess capacity, bases it doesn't need. Um, and yet Congress uh, will not uh, uh, authorize, um, you know, a new round of base closures. That's our problem at the moment. If we can get, you know, a new round, then we can begin to, uh, you know, build uh, these community processes to um, find new um, and, and actually useful ways um, to, to use these facilities. I think it's important to look at original sin as well. Uh, so in, the, in this case, in, 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 and here's a bipartisan uh, perspective on this. Uh, if you look at uh, how this all began, uh, back in the spring of 1945, there was uh, an advisor who went into the White House to talk to Harry Truman. And it was his first time back in the White House since the 1930s. And his name was Herbert Hoover. Hoover is very interesting. He deserves a second look in, in American history. Not that I agree with him or, or his economic policies, but he was also a, a decent Quaker and had some very interesting ideas. One of the things he, one of the pieces of advice he offered to, to Truman was that, look, when you deal with Russia, the thing you have to, and he understood Russia, he'd been there many times, they actually saved millions of Russians during the famine in the 1920s. Uh, he used to be synonymous with humanitarianism. I mean, Hoover used to be synonymous with like Bono back in the day, believe it or not. Uh, he was not so generous with Americans who were starving, but that's another matter. Uh, but he said to Truman, look, the one thing you must not do when you're dealing with Russia is to rearm Germany and, 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 and rattle your saber. And the way to deal with them, the Soviets are paranoid, uh, but if you, if you rearm Germany, it's the one thing you must never, ever, ever do. Um, and once we got the atom bomb, of course, that, they gave us permission to rearm Germany because now we can control Germany using one atom bomb rather than having occupying armies cooperating with the French, British, and, and the Russians to, to, to keep Germany down. And he said the way to deal with Germany is to show them, um, you know, in, in comparison how an open society functions. And eventually they will co collapse under their own contradictions. That was his idea. He said, look, Truman, if you do this, if you rattle your saber, you're looking at decades of regret. And he basically described what the Cold War became before the term had even been coined. So in that sense, it's worth looking at. Um, and just last week, there was a column on uh, a syndicated column on why Russia resents it, resents us. If there's a second Cold War, did we start it? Who wrote that column? Pat Buchanan. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> the paleo cons come full circle. Uh, not that I agree with Pat Buchanan or anything else, but uh, anyway. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Tad Daly with the uh, Center for War Peace Studies in New York. Um, I was really happy to hear our last speaker uh, speak about the United Nations. And um, I, last summer, there was a thing that got hardly any attention, this eyebrow gathering uh, called the Commission on Global Security, Justice, and Governance. Most of the commissioners were uh, former foreign ministers. Um, Madeleine Albright, we may have made a feeling about her, that she is the co-chair of this commission. Fair enough, Phyllis. But the, the, uh, this commission said global governance is something that we ought to be talking about. Global governance mechanisms invented in 1945 probably ought to be rethought. And they called for something called a world conference, a governmental world conference on global institutions in the year 2020, the 75th anniversary year of the UN. And, um, you know, you, Phyllis, and I hope this is fair to say, you used to write a lot more about the UN than you do these so, days. Well, so, so, if I can pull the drugs out of here in the realms of D mill and disarmament and diplomacy. Do you all see some role for the United Nations, and especially if we can imagine democratizing and redesigning the United Nations? Is that something where we ought to put some, some hope and aspiration? This is Phyllis's territory. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. It used to be my territory much more than it has been lately. Um, I think the UN has been, US domination of the UN has not gone away, but it's led to less to a um, an effort to use the UN as a tool, what Madeleine Albright famously or infamously called a tool of American foreign policy, when she said, maybe I shouldn't say this, but the US, the, the UN is a tool of American foreign policy. I was so upset that she said it about a week after my book cover went to press. I wanted to use it on the cover. 
Um, but I think that the UN, uh, the important parts of the UN are no longer the relevant parts. The democratic part of the UN, the General Assembly, the role of the UN in decolonization throughout the, the 40s and the 50s and the 60s was huge. It was both venue and player in the process of decolonization uh, after, after World War II. That was huge. That, that was unchangeable. But the nature of nation states these days is very different. The, the question of threat, the kinds of threats that are global are different than the kinds of threats that used to emerge in the context of, of uh, the United Nations. So I agree with you that if the UN could be forced to accept dramatic democratization changes, which would have to mean various versions of either getting rid of the veto, getting rid of the Security Council altogether, all these idealized views that I don't think are much closer to happening than they were when they were sort of the center of a lot of global discourse 25 years ago, when it was really a big issue in the late 80s into the 90s. We're going to have a, a new, a new uh, uh, Security Council that's going to be made up differently. And every little group of countries came up with their proposal of, of how it should look. None of them went anywhere. None of it worked because the UN still has this fundamental contradiction between democracy and power. The most democratic part of the United Nations, the General Assembly, which isn't really that democratic, because if you have China and Vanuatu having the same votes, it's not exactly democracy, but it's the closest thing, is the least powerful. It's officially, its decisions are officially considered advisory. The, Sec the Security Council, which is clearly the least democratic part of the United Nations, is the part whose decisions are considered binding in international law. That hasn't changed. I haven't heard anybody yet who's got a plan of how to change it. I used to have a lot more hope that somebody was going to come up with a brilliant plan. I've sort of given up on that. I think the, the idea of the UN has a lot of merit. The, U, the world is still divided into nation states. But increasingly, that's not taken very seriously by an awful lot of people. And what we're seeing in the breakdown of states, uh, in, in the Middle East in particular, you know, where the Arab League never made the decision that the, uh, the old Organization of African Unity made, which was to say that colonialism officially divided our peoples uh, into completely artificial countries. But now, and this was in the, in the 50s, it would be more dangerous for us, for the interests of our peoples, to try and rewrite those borders. So we're going to agree to keep them. And that has largely been maintained in, in Africa, not entirely, but more so than other places. But we're seeing not much relevance of, of that nation state basis. And when you look at the contradiction between the interests of states and state sovereignty, which is fundamental to the UN, and its contradiction with human rights, which is supposed to be the other side of the UN, you have this so far irresolvable contradiction. So I'm not terribly optimistic at the moment for for the UN. I haven't given up on it altogether, but I'm not seeing such a likely possibility. So I was honored to um, speak at the UN about a month ago. Um, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, SIPRI, is uh, pretty much the go-to source um, around the world from all sides of the political spectrum um, uh, assessing uh, global military spending, broken out country by country and by various measures. Um, and so it released its most recent report uh, a month ago, and I got to be the commenter. But the third speaker was um, uh, a guy from the Japanese embassy um, whose passion is to create um, a UN uh, 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 monitoring system for, for global military expenditures, so to have countries actually report what they what they spend. Um, uh, I didn't know very much about this, um, and and it sounds like he's um, it, it's a it's been a real uphill climb and continues to be. But um, uh, more countries uh, reported to them uh, this year than last year. So um, it's it's it seems to me an obvious um, useful function for the UN and. Um, and you know, I I am glad that they really are putting um, time and attention into that to that function. Anna, hi. Uh, <laughs> I have a question for you. I've had the privilege of revisiting drug policy recently, 
uh, which the Pope's comments recent, you know, fairly recently in Mexico, and then the Bolivian bishop statement recently on drugs and seeing some softening, especially towards drug addicts, um, and a little softening on drug traffickers, at least a small, small level one. So I'm really interested in the conversation that you're having at the UN and how what other implications there might be um, beyond just you know in the United States or the US role, but what about some of these anti-drug policies that were pushed by the US and the UN um, that are you know jailing thousands of people um, for either low-level trafficking um, or being drug addicts. So I'd be really curious to know how that might change given what the UN has to say and maybe some of the other implications of what you're hearing and how that might impact especially the urban poor and rural poor. Thank you. Uh, I met Chloe um, 2001 in Oregon on a speaking tour and she's working in DC now so great to see you again. Uh, I, um, the UN discourse is interesting because uh, this, the coherence of the UN system is breaking down over this issue. Uh, when you have the UN Office of, of, on Drugs and Crime as being the, you know, the International Drug War Coordinating Agency uh, and all the other arms of the UN, the World Health Organization, UN Development Program, Commission of Human Rights, they're all criticizing the drug warrior saying, you guys have screwed up in every conceivable way, basically. You're not valuing human life, you're obsessed with punishment, uh, and this regime has to change. So the breakdown of that coherence is very interesting to watch. And we've been able to use those other branches of the UN to leverage against the UNODC, which is very important. Um, the UNODC is now funded by Russia primarily, and the UN drug czar is a guy named Yuri Fedotov. Historically, it's always gone to battalions. You know, the UN has these traditions of you know, certain countries run certain things. And with Fedotov, that was the first time the Russians uh, got, got control of it. Uh, and they amped up a lot of their contributions, I think, in order to do that. Uh, uh, but within the uh, US foreign policy, our State Department um, has been one of the, the least responsive in terms of uh, shifting the, the tone of the war on drugs. So I give credit to the Obama administration and the drug czar's office in terms of domestic policies on harm reduction, overdose prevention, treatment, um, some of the criminal justice reforms. Although, but, but when you get to the hard side, uh, with, with gets the policing and the actual war, the war on drugs, they've been much less uh, responsive and so they're slow to move. Having said that, the U.S. ambassador in charge of this, a guy named William Brownfield, uh, head of the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement in the State Department, who's been a tough drug warrior, who's ambassador to Colombia for most of the time in Colombia. He's been, a, you know, he's advocating all the, the eradication policies and the spray planes and all this stuff. Even he has been forced to say that our new policy of the United States with regard to these international conventions and treaties is flexible interpretation. And now he's saying, oh, actually the treaties have always had language in there that, that allowed a lot of latitude for countries to deviate and experiment with other policies now. <coughs> he's basically admitting reality. The world has changed and there's nothing he can do to stop this anymore in my opinion. Uh, and so he's granting license to other countries now to experiment and to deviate from the global orthodoxy. Uh, so I think that and, 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 and that's inconsistent. It's incoherent. It's not, you know, there, it, in, in an ideal world we should reform these treaties or abolish them and start all over again. Um, but flexible interpretation in terms of the short run, perhaps that's all we can get. Uh, but that's what's happening. So it's, it's, there's a lot more political space opening up. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, my name's John from London. I'm doing a PhD on international drug trade. So unfortunately, my question sounds also to you, but um, be great if anyone else could comment. Um, if you did get a President Trump, um, and some of the things he's been saying about Mexico and what they're bringing over to the US, um, would you, do you reckon you would see a regression in terms of um, some of the positive changes we've been seeing in drug policy and we would see a, a maybe a shift in the US position back at the UN um, towards more punitive and you know supply reduction? Yeah, it depends on what you're saying this week. <laughs> He's been on five sides of all issues forever, right? Uh, but in terms of, um, and, and full disclosure, in my private capacity after hours, I'm a foreign and drug policy advisor to Bernie Sanders' campaign. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think the Trump formula for dealing with drugs, and he has said this many times uh, with regard to Mexico, is to build the damn wall. The wall, right? What's still so stupid about this? Number one, uh, as soon as we built part of the fence, the, the wall that is ex exists now, there are four inch uh, gaps in the wall to let uh, sand and wildlife and uh, other things through, not people, 
right? Four inch gaps. But what's the first thing the drafters did? They made their drug packages three and three quarters inches wide. <laughs> literally handing it through. And right after that, they built uh, big flatbed trucks with ramps. They literally drive the ramp up to the wall. And you, there are pictures of SUVs you can see going over the wall. Um, we got better at stopping that. So what's the next thing they did? Well, they reverted 2,000 years, used Roman technology, and used catapults, literally flinging packages over the wall to be picked up by their accomplices. Uh, so let's say we can have some counter catapult technology. Well, they adapted, the traffickers adapted t-shirt cannons. And they actually mounted these things in the back of pickup trucks. They're pneumatic cannons that shoot launch packages of drugs over the wall, far over. Let's suppose we get all of this wall perfected. Well, there's also underneath the wall. So we have now found over 100 narco tunnels, some of them incredibly sophisticated. El Chapo escaped using one of them. Right? These things have rail systems. They have plumbing. They have ventilation. They have uh, all kinds of things. Um, and the, once they're open, you can move tons of drugs 24-7, and you can move drug uh, money and, and weapons south, um, as, also, as well as human smuggling. But let's suppose we get the wall, and we build the wall really, really deep, so it stops that. Well, the traffickers responded with narco submarines, right? So it used to be speedboats, then fish, fishing boats, then speedboats. Um, then we got better at stopping those. And so they decided to build semi-submersibles that are 90% underwater. They can carry you know, 6 to 12 tons of drugs per run. And now we got better at detecting those. So they built proper submarines that can dive 50 feet below water. So every time one of those gets through, that's 10 tons, right? Um, and let's suppose that we deal with that and, and, and find some way to stop that somehow. Uh, then there's the aerial route. So they used to use small planes. They got better at detecting them. Uh, they would even take the risk of using old airliners on one-way trips. That's how much profit there is in this economy, right? And they would crash land, crash land on the other side and just recover the drugs. Uh, so we got better at inter interdicting larger planes. So they switched to ultralights, right? Those little flimsy lawnmower engine airplanes with a drop cage, several hundred pounds of, of drugs. They fly over, just over the wall but under the radar, and they release the drop cage and the drugs go across. So uh, we got better, we got, we're able to detect some of those now. So what's the next step? Drones. Uh, so in every way conceivable, the countermeasures have been producing worse problems. Uh, from, from a point of view of Homeland Security, when I talk to people in Homeland Security, they realize how stupid the drug war is, some of them, and the military. Because what we've done is essentially set up an X prize for drug traffickers to find new and innovative ways. That, this is not something you want to do. Al-Qaeda or ISIS on their own would never have had the money and the resources or the ingenuity to come up with these incredibly elaborate uh, ways of, of bypassing our borders. Uh, and so you never want to you know, incentivize your adversaries to do the one thing that you fear the most. Because the, right now they're using them primarily for drugs. But what if someday they collaborated with terrorists and started moving other things in those tunnels and submarines? Then, then it's really dangerous. Um, could I just? I would just add one real quick. Uh, Sanho mentioned the changing face of um, addiction in the United States, particularly with reference to the opioid crisis. Um, if you look at a map of precinct voting, precinct by precinct voting, uh, Donald Trump's best precincts uh, are the ones where the white mortality rate is climbing the fastest, and which happens to have heavy, heavy overlap with uh, the places where this opioid crisis is flourishing. Uh, and I think that's, um, you know, Donald Trump, when he talks about the, the, the miseries of these particularly working class white Americans, there's a lot of scapegoating on Mexico and all of that. Um, but so for, for all of the danger that's attendant and the kind of discourse that he's bringing to these problems, uh, you're also seeing uh, an interesting breaking of the consensus on, you know, these are people that are now seeing what these policies look like in their communities. And I'm not convinced it's an obvious winner. So does that, I don't, how does that translate to UN policy? I don't know. Donald Trump probably doesn't know either. But um, that was just one thing I would add, is like the, 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 op the opioid America has a lot of overlap with Trump America. Uh, and, and I think that's, um, that's going to create some opportunities for, for changing how we talk about it in the years to come. I think most of life's lessons can be learned from one episode of The Simpsons or another. And I think there's a connection here. Because I think what uh, is uh, why Trump is getting so much traction can best be explained by Bart Simpson. He went to a class president in an episode of The Simpsons. But he get, begins by a negative attack at it against his opponent. And he says, my opponent says there are no easy answers. Well, I say he's not looking hard enough. <laughs> That's why Donald Trump is so popular. That's why Fox News gets tr such traction. Uh, is because people want easy answers. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the most intractable problems have counterintuitive answers.
So I have Maybe we should take a few questions before we come back to this. So now I'm going to come in. This will hopefully anchor uh, a lot of this series is about movement building. And I'd like to get back to that. One of the things you said that did influence was that uh, it should be youth focused and uh, that there should be this component of uh, persons of color. And uh, they're probably uh, all, of, all of the movement building could benefit from a, uh, a central galvanizing intellectual center to kind of uh, move that. Uh, you know, so hoping that the outcome of this work and other people do is kind of help that drumbeat of movement building to, to get a better test. Um, I kind of feel that this discussion has been small ball, and what, what it, I find missing, and what is in part, I think, the space that that allowed drop Donald Trump to exist, is that we're not talking about creating meaningful and rewarding lives for people, and that our goal should be to create meaningful lives for ourselves, our neighbors, and then other people in other countries as well. And so we're not talking about the four freedoms, the, you know, Roosevelt's four freedoms. Uh, we're not talking about the, the covenants on human rights and economic and social human rights. We're not talking about development. I mean, the problem with the Middle East is, you know, people don't have jobs and the opportunity for meaningful existence. Uh, so, what, why, what is there something to have a movement to coalesce around when nobody is talking about, you know, something that can be unifying? What's happening with Trump is that people are saying the disconnect between tax expenditures, military policy, they don't, under, they don't remember why we created NATO, why we created the United Nations why we did all these types of things. So it just becomes, you know, what's the purpose of regulation? Uh, so to me, this is what's what something like IPS can do. It's not just policy ideas, but it's hooking the policy to some teleological end. Uh, so it's more of a comment, uh, but it just strikes me in this kind of forum that And we'll do this last and that can be Okay. My concerns were I think similar when we talk about the Democrats regaining Congress, there are some areas where yes that would make a difference in terms of basic civil reproductive rights. But I mean the Democrats had all three branches of government for two years. Did nothing other than institutionalize the insurance industry to continue to steal billions of dollars off of the top of money and for health care, lost both chambers, elected the same leaders who lost both chambers, and didn't understand why they lost, because they didn't offer anything to the majority of ailing workers, Republicans, Democrats, whatever, they still want a decent life. I don't think there would have been a Tea Party if the Democrats had taken the American Society of Civil Engineers list of crumbling infrastructure and instead of bailing out the crooks, put America back to work. So part of my concern is how do we mobilize to elect progressive Democrats with that type of an agenda that will draw people rather than divide people and make room for someone such as Trump or even Cruz. And, and the other side of the coin is the research, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, that says for every one job created with military spending, that same amount of money in the public sector 
would create a minimum of nine jobs with broad reaching tertiary economic spin offs. But that too, to me, ties in with problems with our trade deals. Because as long as we sell our economy to the highest campaign contributor to go and, and make the cheapest product at the expense of health, safety, and our own economy, what jobs would we be talking about? And I think Solyndra is an example of where we had a really innovative product. It was like a Legos, the way those panels, those solar panels fit together. And then we let the Chinese dump their cheap panels made with slave labor with no health, safety, and labor regulations. So how do we tie those issues in, which I think are, are uh, address what the majority of the American people are realizing and looking for, and change protectionism from a somewhat disparaging, frightening term to what it was, protecting our economy, enabling other countries to protect their economies so we don't dump Monsanto and destroy the tortilla small family. Um, enterprise and economy in countries such as Mexico. Thank you. Um, well, I'll just a couple of things. Uh, IPS commissioned that study that showed that a billion dollars put into the military creates 11,000 jobs. You put it into education, 20, all, all of that. So um, I feel proud of that. The other thing I'll say is that I spent last week in Cuba. Um, and, uh, you know, enormous problems all over, but uh, there was such a sense of, you know, there, there were discussions going on all over the place about how those problems should be solved. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I come back here and I, I agree with you, it just feels like small ball the way people, the way people talk uh, and, and the, the narrow frames that are put around uh, Put around our problems, um, and um, you know I appreciate uh, this prod to IPS to to live up to its what it thinks of as it, as its mission um, to really connect issues and see how um, they are connected and uh, to to get beyond um, uh, the silos that that separate issues and and. Um, really think in terms of, uh, you know, the underlying values um, that need to undergird a progressive movement. So I, I appreciate um, uh, that that call to action for for IPS, and and we will we will we've done our best. We will continue to do our best, but we, we need to be um, uh, you know pushed and and uh, encouraged as I feel that we are. I would just add to that. I think that uh, the question of what of how we build movements remains really key. And I, I come back to to Mel's question about you know what does it mean to say well we want to to privilege the role of young people, the role of people of color in those movements in terms of who leads. And that is a huge challenge for all of us, as we've seen in in uh, in in our movements, the movements that are rising right now, the movements for the in the fight for 15, the movements. For for GLBT rights, the movements for immigrant rights, all of these movements, the 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 restaurant workers union <clears throat> movements, all of these are led by young people of color, uh, and that's not a it's not a coincidence, you know, that that's the uh, the reality. I don't think any of us. Well, I shouldn't. I won't speak for that, but I I think most people in and around IPS don't see the Democratic Party as being the solution. And certainly don't see electing people as the solution, at least not by itself. Electing fabulous people doesn't change structures, doesn't change society, doesn't change the world. Movements change the world. And when we look at our work, we, we talk about the need defining our, our public scholarship, our activist scholarship work, meaning something that has to do with empowering movements. Because you can have the best ideas in the world and put them on the desk of the most powerful people in the world. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean jack. You need movements to force the enforcement of those good ideas to make it possible. It was the old Roosevelt line, the old FDR line, 
I get what you want me to do, now go out there and make me do it. He understood he couldn't just announce stuff. It had to be the result of social movements that was going to make it a necessity within society as a whole. So when we think about elections, I mean, elections, in my view, is always about lesser evils. It's always about lesser evils. It's, it's not our terrain. It's not our turf. It's not the turf of social movements. But sometimes there can be a huge gap between the evil and the lesser evil. Sometimes you can have a really good person in there uh, who's, who's not themselves evil, but it's an evil process that means that people end up having to make concessions, having to make compromises that they wouldn't on their own make because it's not a good system. But it's the system that has power. So we can't afford to simply sit it out and say, elections don't matter. You know, there's an old Pete Seeger saying that, that says, you know, it, they, it matters the most. Lesser evil matters the most to people at the bottom rung of the social and economic hierarchies because those are the people most vulnerable. And, you know, there was this thing from Pete Seeger when he said, when the water is up over your mouth, that last half inch to where it covers your nose, that's life and death. So there might be only a small difference, but it can mean life or death to people who have the least privilege and the least access to power in society. So that's, I think, what we're often dealing with when we talk about elections. And that's why we don't talk about elections any more than we have to. When there's an election campaign going on, you kind of have to. But we try not to. We try to talk about building movements instead. And that's where the real changing of the world happens. I think the question about um, meaningful lives uh, is the most interesting one uh, for me because it touches on not just my issue but every other issue we work on, uh, that we have destroyed life ways that were sustainable over many generations by this thing we call modernity, that we look around us and we assume that this world we built of concrete, steel, petroleum, silicon is the way things were meant to be and could only have been this way. There is nothing inevitable or natural about this. This is a series of decisions we have made as a society or refuse to make because we privatized and deregulated and let the market make those decisions for us. But we think this is, this is the way things are meant to be and nothing could be farther from the truth. And so it's important to wind back that clock to see where we went off the rails. Um, to look at other traditional societies, to look at first principles. What does it take to build a healthy human being and a healthy community? Uh, and that's what I find so interesting in my travels around the world, uh, working with people in the Amazon, uh, indigenous peoples in the Amazon, First Nations, Native Americans. Just two months ago, I gave a talk at a, a Maori uh, meeting house in New Zealand, and uh, talking about indigenous peoples and self-medication. And I think, in many ways, uh, the the amount of drug use we have in modern society. Um, it is a natural reaction to a world gone mad, but it's inchoate. We don't know how to phrase it. It's on the tip of our tongue. We can't really put our finger on what's gone wrong, uh, but it's this destruction of sustainable life ways and meaning um, that is so central to this. And if you're interested in hearing this in a half hour format, go to YouTube, tap, type my name, San Ho, and the word Maori. It'll be the first result that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> We have another round that's going to end with. I think Phyllis has to go. So we want to thank Phyllis because she's got another team that she's got to get. Only five minutes to get to that now. Ten minutes. Thank you, Phyllis. And then um, <laughs> there's the last round. Um, uh, so you just tell us. Thank you. First, I'm going to meet everyone. So everyone will go. This gentleman here. And then Mark. Uh, we're gonna, okay. um, I think I can have to, I'm sorry, I had to cut it off there because otherwise I didn't want to go. So, Mark is the last person. This gentleman is just coming from the market. Hey, I'm, I'm Jackson, the state department, and I just wanted to say that uh, it feels hard to start with the start. But, uh, but I'm going to tell us on the way out for the use of the word contingency. My grandson is in the 173rd Airborne. There's a NATO, it turns out I thought it was a NATO rapid reaction force, you know, dancing with the bear, persuasion, and not good enough to miscalculate. In fact, it's called the NATO contingency force. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, you know, I, that, uh, just a few ideas I wanted to throw out here. Reaction one, to me, it seems like Trump is our first authoritarian strongman candidate, seriously, been a long time, since Huey Long. Uh, Europe is no stranger to Every country in Europe has them all the time. They, they know how to deal with it. We're, we're a little caught by surprise by the population right wing. You know, but uh, also, though, many people have kind 
one of the state of the Don't count the military out. In a real liberal environment, they're pretty conservative. In a, liberal, in a conservative environment, they're pretty liberal. Military bases were liberal forces in the South, you know, in, in, against desegregation. And um, you know, don't forget Zinni, Skokoff, Kentucky, all those top commanders, which they don't want to get, don't want to uh, get him. <laughs> Iran, Iraq, you know, don't do it, don't do it, it's crazy. And uh, I'll bet if you took, a, I, if, there's no way to do this, but I bet if you took, a, if you could hold the military, I bet they put it for Obama, for so many minorities in the military. I'll, I'll bet overall county and list of the people for Obama. But when I was walking down the halls of the Pentagon one day, 1989, every ashtray in the Pentagon, down the hallway. Yeah. Big green paper on saying all air trade are surplus. No more. Or any other country in here. And um, when I was a kid in Spain, I was in the embassy there, but, um, they retired B 47. They were so skilled. It was, a, it was early jet bombers for the B 52. And they had this really uh, great suit on it. They said this weapon was such a good weapon that it never had. And uh, that was a real, that was a real, a very propagandistic, but very skilled also. And, uh, the other thing I just want to say was that um, uh, when you were saying, do you want to talk at all about the, uh, about how this whole opiate thing, in the 1900s, the huge wave of reform, Robert Barron, so corrupt, so horrible, huge wave of reform, and among them were the pure food and drug addicts, but besides, besides the trust bus thing. And one of the things, in, in, in newspapers in the South, 1900, people were talking about the cocaine craze, <coughs> legal rapists, and the marijuana craze, Mexican, not including Mexicans, and the uh, uh, people smoking Chinese in their dens. And it was it, it, it was cleanse this land, but in a very uh, racist form, also. Like, get rid of the drugs, get rid of the minorities, also. And uh, one of the things that came out right away, primary abuse of opioids, was white women in the South, and got medicine. You know, they and when you quit doing it, you felt pretty sick. So, um, this person, this gentleman left, I'm going to let you um, say something. And I'm going to also take a variety of let Bob squeeze in. He's pretty short and concise. So, we're going to squeeze Bob in. And then, okay, we're going to give it up. So, Bob, you'll be the last two days. Hi, I'm with Code Pink. I'm going to turn to your friend, Seattle, Washington. Uh, and I have a question about militarization overseas. Uh, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have expressed that military is overseas are good, and even Donald Trump recently said that American or that Japanese should be paying for U.S. bases in Okinawa. And I wanted to ask about our military military bases overseas, and particularly our frigates in Asia, and our reactions from China. One more last question. Um, I heard on the news recently that the issue of uh, liability for 9 11 um, was raised in Congress over suing Saudi Arabia, and that the White House had qualms about that. Uh, maybe because of the legal precedent that could then be used against the U.S. for our wars of aggression. I'm wondering if that isn't a strategic um, avenue for exploration, because I, I think that now when we declare war, when we conduct wars, we are not held accountable for the destructive consequences of those wars. And frankly, I would like to see the UN and other uh, organizations hold the US accountable. And I think this kind of legal argument uh, really needs to be uh, uh, developed. Is that all the questions, Nefa? Um, I'll jump in on a few of those. Um, I, so I think there's a lot of complicated geopolitical reasons that the uh, Obama administration doesn't want to stick their thumb in the Saudis' eye over their um, 
over there, obvious like some kind. Of, there's obviously some kind of Saudi connection. At the very least, the you know what was it like 15 of the 19 hijackers were uh, were from Saudi Arabia. Um, the rest of them, they're pretty much all from countries where the U.S. have been propping up some kind of dictatorship or another. Um, I'm not so sure it has a. a, a I, I mean, this is just purely speculative. I'm not sure it has a great deal to do with issues of legal culpability for the simple reason that we have <laughs> every war that we've launched, like since Iraq, has been just blatantly illegal in the international sense. And even Libya, where we had a facade of um, like, all right, we're going to use this resolution to protect civilians and in, in the context of this uprising, like that very quickly turned into a regime change and uh, is very quick, like very soon going to lead to another intervention in Libya very soon. So uh, I'm not sure, like if they had been like treading on ice over these things, like maybe I would say like, Okay, maybe they are. That is what they're worried about. Uh, I think it has somewhat more to do with um, the other uh, the other decisions the Saudis are making in the Middle East that are giving a lot of people headaches. But also, we're still sort of appeasing them in this war in Yemen, and they just I, my sense is they just don't want the Saudis to rock the boat over this Iran deal any more than they already have. Total personal opinion. I don't know if either of you want to weigh in on that question before we move to the others. Um, no, I. Um, hmm. So I mentioned that uh, we have with us uh, the man who wrote the book on uh, global military bases. Um, I, I'd love to hear him weigh in on on your question. And and you know I agreed with much of what what you said. Um, the point I'd really push back on was was the idea that we we need to have all these uh, military all these weapons. Um, so that they never have to be used. Um, to me, that's that's a recipe for bankrupting ourselves. And you know, comes back to uh, if the only uh, tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Yeah. Clever, clever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, David. Do you want to weigh in here? We've actually talked about it a little bit, but uh, just real quickly, um, I mean, I think it's safer rat rattling the, the ship in Asia. Um, you know, there was no, and there continues to be no good reason to shift large amounts of military bases or troops to East Asia. The U.S. has had a, a really large presence there for decades. Um, but I, I do feel like there's an opportunity to connect the bases issue with the crumbling infrastructure at home that a number of people have raised, and I, I think. There's an awareness now I sense when it comes to Flint and the Metro, we'll just start there, um, <laughs> that, that our infrastructure is crumbling in a, in a different way than, than when the American Society of Engineers. Anyway, I, I think I would like to explore um, ways to connect military spending, military bases, and crumbling infrastructure at home and, and, and um, hammer at home the idea that Military spending beyond killing people by dropping bombs is killing people when we're not using that money in far smarter ways. Good point, Dan. On the last oh, sorry. about the, uh, the opioid <laughs> crisis, this. I think that's a really important point you made about racism in the drug war, because the drug war has always been rooted in racism. Uh, if you look at the first 100 years of this country, there were no drug laws whatsoever. Uh, anything was available, and of course, a lot of people used opium, including the founding fathers. So Benjamin Rush, uh, Rush Medical School, uh, Ben Franklin. These people were were yeah, of the opium. Um, but they had very famous careers. Uh, but the first uh, uh, drug laws in this country were in San Francisco, targeted at people who looked like me. Right? It was the end of the railroads had been finished. There was a recession. Uh, Chinese labor was competing against Irish labor. Uh, and if you look at the editorial cartoons in the San Francisco newspapers, it was all about these drug-crazed Chinamen uh, who be smoking opium and luring white women into the opium dens. Same if you go to the turn of the century, look at the southern papers. Uh, African Americans were portrayed as being the drug-crazed cocaine Negro who was going to rape white women. So one of the reasons the southern sheriffs went to a 32 caliber bullet, 38 caliber bullet, was the stereotypes of people of color, particularly black men, raping white women. So you need a bigger bullet because they were drug-crazed. Same with Mexican Americans. Uh, and so it, it, the drug war has always been about social control of groups that were deemed to be undesirable or, or could, be, could be targeted. Um, but it, it goes back to the roots of the country, right? The founding of this hemisphere in terms of Western colonization, the reason most of you are here in this room today is because of drugs. Columbus was not after gold. He was after spices. Why, why were spices important back then? It wasn't just because the food was awful in Europe. 
is because every new exotic spice was thought to have certain special properties. Viagra, it was a Viagra of the day. Part of the reason the world got colonized is much more old white men in Europe couldn't get it up. And if you then look at the history, the colonial history of this hemisphere, what were the original crops that funded the empires, that built the banking systems in Europe? They were founded on tobacco, on sugar, which we get rum from, both our drugs. Uh, tobacco, uh, coffee, tea, spices. These, this is what made fortunes in Europe. Um, at the time of the American Revolution, Barbados was worth more to the British Empire than the 13 colonies of the United States. Why? Sugar. Sugar and rum. Uh, and so the drugs have always been part and parcel of, of, of the way our world functions. But we only think of drugs as what other cultures use. We don't identify them as our own drugs. Right? And so this, this, this hypocrisy, I think, is at the root of a lot of this. All right, then. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks.